Content Warning Police Violence and Abuse When a suspect is killed by a police officer, the community mourns, the family rages, friends cry, and the police department defends itself from any accusation of wrongdoing. The police department is assisted in this defense by a willing, uncritical media that knows not to push too hard against an institution that the people believe is populated with heroes. When a police officer shoots a suspect, media outlets write their headlines in passive voice or with euphemistic language. Officer-involved shooting is a common term that provides cover or feigns neutrality. The police department is assisted by the media in other ways. Through punditry, common narratives about the suspect such as, he was no angel, and the police are here for our protection. Another common narrative about the suspect, one that is often repeated without skepticism, is some variation of, he shouldn't have resisted arrest. The implication of this talking point is that compliance with the police will invariably lead to a better and safer outcome and that any force used against a suspect is justified no matter how trivial the resistance or how trivial the initial alleged crime. This talking point shifts the blame to the suspect. This talking point is absolutist, meaning if an individual is suspected of any crime, from homicide to selling cigarettes, the same lethal force is justified. If a suspect resists arrest through any means whatsoever, from attacking the police officer to simply backing away, the same lethal force is justified. In fact, this absolutist talking point also provides cover for a police officer even if the suspect is proven not to be responsible for the initial suspected crime. If the suspect resists an arrest based on false information, that itself is a crime, and that is enough to allow the defenders of the police officers to provide justification for the death of the suspect. The public's perception of the modern centralized police force has evolved in the wake of the death of George Floyd, the conviction of Derek Chauvin, and the media attention given to similar incidents over the past 12 months. The public is finally beginning to be aware of the fact that police violence cannot be solved simply through compliance alone, and police violence can even be instigated through compliance. The argument of non-compliance justifies death, hereafter referred to as the non-compliance justification, has a few obvious problems. First, the non-compliance justification is based on the premise that any resistance is cause for a lethal response, something that can often be defended legally but is more challenging to defend rationally or morally. Second, the justification is also based on the premise that compliance will invariably result in both fair treatment by the arresting officer and the safety of the suspect, something often proven untrue. Third, the related assumption is that resistance will invariably lead to worse treatment, something unproven as an absolute. Fourth, the justification brushes up against the just world fallacy, meaning that it presumes the arresting officer is doing their job fairly and judiciously, that no matter the circumstances and no matter what the officer does, the suspect is getting what he deserves. Fifth, the justification presumes the rights and authority of the police, rights that are self-justifying, the non-compliance justification must be interrogated because far too often it is used by the police, the media, politicians, and a portion of the population to provide cover, to shift blame, and to dismiss the lives of suspects as forfeit under the flimsiest rationalizations. The question of suspect non-compliance can be answered by examining common arguments that defend and valorize the police. Among the most common arguments in defense of the police is also an argument that confers suspicion on anyone who does not share this admiration. If you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to worry about. This argument is often used by police officers to encourage compliance, but it is also used by politicians and ordinary citizens to defend controversial laws, surveillance, and the institution of policing itself. The implication of this argument is not only that the potential suspect should not worry, but also that if the suspect is concerned about the police in any way, that alone is suspicious. It's a trick argument. If the potential suspect says, I have nothing to hide, then the individual making the argument says, then you have nothing to worry about, and encourages the potential suspect hearing the argument to comply with the police. 
if the potential suspect says, I don't want to give up my autonomy and place my faith entirely in the police, then the individual making the argument says, then you have something to hide, which to them justifies interrogation, arrest, and harm to the suspect if they resist. In either outcome, the individual making the argument gets what they want. It's not an exchange of ideas or a debate, it's a trap. It's a variation on the loaded question, rhetoric that contains a controversial and unproven assumption. The most famous example of this is the question, have you stopped beating your wife? Whether the respondent says yes or no, they will be admitting to the crime. The way out of a loaded question is to reject the premise of the question instead of giving one of the two predetermined answers. In the case of the nothing to hide argument, this premise can be rejected in several ways. For example, the nothing to hide argument mistakenly concludes that privacy and autonomy are things that are only desired by criminals. Of course, privacy is actually generally understood as fundamental to an individual's freedom. Without privacy and autonomy of the individual, there is control of the individual. For another example, the nothing to hide argument presumes guilt until proven otherwise, which is the opposite of how our criminal justice system and indeed society is meant to function. We are innocent until proven guilty by the criminal justice system, not the other way around. Yet another way to reject the premise is to conclude that even if one has nothing to hide, there is an understandable lack of trust between the individual and the state. The information that the state gathers may not uncover anything technically criminal, but could still be used against an individual nonetheless. Some things are not criminal, but are still embarrassing, and some things might not be currently criminal, but could be at a later date. Or the information could be used by someone else who gains access to it. Or the information could be used by a future administration for unjust purposes, even if the current administration has no such intent. Or the information could be used to fabricate a crime. Upton Sinclair once said, A study of many labor cases had taught me the methods of the agent provocateur. He is quite willing to take real evidence if he can find it, but if not, he has familiarized himself with the affairs of his victim and can make evidence which will be convincing when exploited by the yellow press. Yet another way to reject the premise is to admit that even if a suspect has nothing criminal to hide, surveillance, intrusion, and overreach are frightening all on their own and can cause psychological harm for individuals under this surveillance and suspicion. Interrogation, searches, and arrests are harmful or even traumatic even if they do not lead to a day in court or conviction. Full disclosure, I have had my car searched twice by law enforcement, one time without my permission and another time with my permission. In other words, whether I cooperated or not, my car was going to be searched. In both cases, nothing was found. I have been detained, but not arrested by law enforcement at a national border twice and questioned by the police based on wrong information on another occasion, but in all instances I have never been arrested or charged with a crime. I have no criminal record. Nevertheless, each instance with law enforcement was unnecessary and in some cases humiliating. And no interaction with the police, even after they had concluded I had done nothing wrong, has ever ended with anything even resembling, I'm sorry, we were wrong. Instead, every interaction has ended with some variation of, you're free to go, which I assure you, is not the same thing. Nobody wants to feel less than. In short, there are completely legitimate reasons why individuals do not always comply with the police, and sometimes non-compliance is not illegal. Now, resisting arrest almost always is illegal, but not all non-compliance is resisting arrest. For instance, at least on paper, police officers cannot conduct a search without cause, and failing cause, police officers cannot conduct a search without permission. These laws vary by state to state and by situation. Individuals have rights and are under no obligation to comply with the police beyond what they are legally required and have no obligation to explain why. So, what about non-compliance that is technically illegal? What about resisting arrest? I would never encourage a stranger to do something illegal, and I am not going to do so today. However, we still have to understand why a suspect would resist arrest. Because an explanation that begins and ends with, 
resisting arrest is illegal and therefore unjustifiable, does not give a full scope of the picture, and does not explain motivation, and presumes too much. It presumes the innocence and righteousness of the police, presumes that the arresting officer is always correct, and that every arrest is legitimate, presumes that both the law in question is just and that the criminal justice system is always fair, and presumes that illegal always equals morally wrong, and that legal always equals morally right. So, let's interrogate why an individual might feel the need to resist arrest. First, the suspect may have understandable moral objections. An arrest, or even temporary imprisonment afterwards, involves treatment of an individual that, under any other circumstances, would be widely considered morally unjustified. Physically restraining someone, confining them to a car, confining them to a small room, and finally forcing that individual to argue their way out of the circumstances to freedom would be both unjustified and illegal if it were done by anyone else except the police. It would be assault and kidnapping. We allow the criminal justice system to be an exception to this, to inflict on its citizens out of a societal contract and an institutionalized belief in retributive justice. But, when an individual is faced with circumstances that would otherwise be considered immoral, their reluctance to comply is understandable. Next, an individual may have economic objections. A great many arrests and convictions result in fines rather than jail time, making the cost of an arrest insurmountable for many people. Furthermore, an arrest will often require the suspect to arrange to pay a bail bond, Further still, even if the arrest or detention does not lead to a trial and the suspect is allowed to go without being charged, the detention itself may have an economic impact because the suspect would not be able to work that day. If it goes to trial, they can't work that day either. Individuals suffering from economic hardship have reasonable objections to being arrested on what may be a false charge or a minor infraction. Backing away and pleading with a police officer not to arrest them seems understandable given the circumstances and the consequences of being detained for even a day. Next, an individual may be reluctant to comply because of the humiliation of being arrested and the fear of temporarily losing autonomy over their body. Being arrested cannot help but be traumatic for many people. To be taken away by a complete stranger, often after having a gun pointed at them, police search the suspect often touching them in a manner that under any other circumstances would be criminal. This may be particularly terrifying for an individual who has had a previous sexual trauma, as the encounter may trigger memories of that incident. The threat of the trauma trigger may be enough to send the suspect's body into a defensive posture, prompting resistance to the arrest. If a police officer attempts to arrest a suspect while the two are alone, the arrest feels dangerous, especially for women if the arresting officer is a man. If the police officer attempts to arrest a suspect in public with witnesses, the experience is not only humiliating but can damage the suspect's reputation among their neighbors. Next, people of color may be particularly resistant to arrest due to a long history of racial profiling and racial violence at the hands of the predominantly white police force in the United States. Next, a suspect might resist their arrest due to a history of violence among the police. An arrest is so threatening that resisting arrest, though dangerous, might appear less dangerous than compliance. Defenders of the police claim that it is only through resistance that suspects face violence, and that once arrested, suspects will be treated well and face no violence. However, some of the most high-profile deaths have occurred while in police custody. In April of 2015, Freddie Gray was arrested for carrying a knife. The police officers believed that the spring-assisted knife was in violation of the laws, whereas the state's attorney for Baltimore City later claimed that such a knife was completely legal. But either way, Gray was arrested and given what is commonly called a rough ride, a purposeful injuring of a suspect while in custody on the way to the police station. Gray died. Tragically, death while in police custody is a fairly common occurrence. In addition to this, violence against women in police custody can often be sexual, as the dynamics make women vulnerable to this abuse. Data on this pattern is incomplete due to fear of reporting, which means these statistics are generally understood to be only a fraction of total abuse suffered by women at the hands of the police.
Defenders of the police claim that if suspects know that the police are violent and dangerous and have a pattern of killing suspects without just cause, then why resist? However, this argument puts the onus on the suspect, even while admitting that it is the police who are dangerous and not the suspect. On the most basic, human level, suspects resist arrest because they have been taught all their lives and learned through their experiences to not comply with someone who might mean them harm. Race and gender may compound this non-compliance, but resistance in the face of harm is universal, and at the very least, should be acknowledged. In spite of the fact that non-compliance with an armed stranger is an understandable and very human response, those who never find fault in the police must always blame any violence that a suspect suffers on said suspect. When a police officer kills a suspect, apologists invariably claim that it was justified using a kind of circular argument. A police officer must only kill if necessary. Therefore, if the police officer killed the suspect, it must have been necessary. That does not account for the possibility that the police officer either killed the suspect without any real provocation, or that the police officer was marginally provoked, but used an excessive, disproportionate amount of force. For example, George Floyd resisted arrest, but he did not resist arrest in such a way that threatened the life of Derek Chauvin. Furthermore, Floyd's alleged crime was non-violent and therefore not a significant threat to the community. It could be argued that if the incident had not been recorded and spread throughout the news media, Chauvin would never have been arrested, let alone convicted. Conviction of a police officer for an on-duty killing is extremely rare. There are many problems with proportionality of response. First, a police officer may use deadly force if he believes there is a credible threat against himself or others. However, that determination is made by the police officer in the moment and is rarely contradicted. Second, if a suspect resists arrest by fleeing the scene, even if this escape is not a threat to the police officer, the police are often permitted to fire on the fleeing suspect. This sounds absurd and contradicts the notion that police only use deadly force when absolutely necessary, but the United States Supreme Court has ruled that this is somehow acceptable. From a Supreme Court ruling in 1985, where the officer has probable cause to believe that the suspect poses a threat of serious physical harm either to the officer or to others, it is not constitutionally unreasonable to prevent escape by using deadly force. In other words, police are allowed to shoot unarmed suspects in the back if the officers have concluded that there is cause to do so. Once again, this cause is generally determined by the officer on the spot, and due to this Supreme Court ruling, it is not often contradicted. Such incidents are sometimes called awful but lawful, meaning the incident and justification are both obviously wrong, obviously irrational, but still protected by a society that values police officers' lives more than others. Whether or not something is determined to be currently legal is not the final word on it being right or wrong. Apologists for the police often point to the dangers of the occupation to dismiss police violence. They say, police officers only kill so many people because their job is so dangerous. According to Officer Down, 364 police officers in the United States died in the line of duty in 2020. However, very few of these instances were the result of suspects killing police officers or suspects resisting arrest. Most were from COVID. Officers actually killed by suspects include 1 by assault, 13 by vehicular assault, and 45 by gunfire. In total, 59 police officers were directly killed by suspects in 2020. Comparatively, the police killed 1,021 people in the United States in 2020. According to Industrial Safety and Hygiene News, police officers are not even in the top 20 most dangerous professions. Strange as this may sound, a pizza delivery driver is far more likely to be killed in the line of duty than a police officer. Any death is tragic, and I would never claim otherwise, but the danger of being a police officer is often overstated as a means of justifying their behavior. In conclusion, Based on the evidence and simple common sense, police violence cannot be solved only through compliance. Police violence can sometimes be instigated through compliance. And the justifications for incidents of police violence often use exaggerated statistics and flimsy rationalizations.
we have to be better at discussing police shootings. In order to hold the police accountable, we must allow ourselves to be skeptical of the police whenever there is a shooting. We should not presume guilt, but we must be reasonably skeptical due to how the data is collected and how often we have seen the pattern of police shootings and the pattern of justification. That is why the non-compliance justification is so dangerous, because it presumes a default innocence on the part of the police. It is the opposite of skepticism, the opposite of accountability.